Hey everyone, welcome back. We are in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. We've got a different mic today, so it might sound a little bit different. This is the one I used on that uh, a few videos ago. One of my friends told me that the audio sounded better with this mic, and I went back and I agree with him. And he's a fellow YouTuber, so I, I believe him. <laughs> uh, his I'll actually link his channel down below. He does like financial stuff and investing and a bunch of cool stuff, so go check that out. Verses 11 through 17 is our what we're covering. I have to apologize. There is a mistake in the book. I, for some reason, I left off verses 13 through 17 in the notes. They're not in there. Sometimes I think I'm only going to write about a certain section when I'm writing the notes, and then I end up clumping it together. But in this case, I went and forgot to add the note or add the relevant verses back into the text section. So forgive me for that. But I will read them off my computer, so you'll still have them. Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 11 through 17. In the context here is Jesus just finished healing the centurion's servant at the beginning of chapter 7. Now he's going to go to a place called Nain. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all of the surrounding country. This is a really interesting story. There aren't too many resurrections from the dead in the Gospels or just in the Bible as a whole. And so this is very interesting. And it's only found here in Luke chapter 7. None of the other Gospel writers record this, which is really interesting to me because it, I mean, this would have been a pretty incredible miracle. Nain was located on the northern slopes of the hill Mora, or Moray, M-O-R-E-H, I don't know how to pronounce it, and was six miles southeast of Nazareth. That is according to the Lexham Geographic Commentary on the Gospels, which I will tell you, if you're into, into studying the geography and the topography of that area of the world, that's a really good book. I have a digital copy of it. You might know where Nazareth is. So Nain is about six miles northeast, and on the map that's in the notes, I have it highlighted there, just to the northwest of the Sea of Galilee. So this is the only time that I could find that Nain is mentioned in the Bible. So Jesus is approaching this town. He's with his disciples, and it says a great crowd went with him. And he, he sees this funeral procession going out of town, and this young man had died, and he was being carried out to be buried. And the, mo or the, uh, the, the sorrow of the scene increases even more when we're told that his mother was part of the funeral procession. And it increases even more when we realize that this was her only son. And it becomes even sadder when we realize that her husband was also dead. So she was a widow. So now she didn't have a husband and she didn't have any children. And when you understand kind of the, the culture of those days and realize that women didn't have the kind of employment opportunities that we have today, this would leave this woman somewhat destitute. We don't know if she had, you know, other extended family who could care for her or whatever, but widows were often kind of in a tough spot in those days because of the um, just because of the position that they were put in because of the culture didn't have a lot of opportunities to make much money. So this woman's future was kind of bleak. Not, a, not only was it sad, but it was, it was bleak financially speaking. So Jesus saw this scene, and uh, he had compassion on the woman, and he told her not to cry. <laughs> Most of the time when we, you know, maybe those aren't the best words for comforting somebody who's in sorrow. We tell people not to cry, but we can't do anything about the situation <laughs> to give them a reason not to cry anymore. However, Jesus could. So this might have been a little bit more appropriate for him to say, uh, not so much of a an applicable statement when we're at a funeral. <laughs> but I digress. 
He then goes up to the beer, which is spelled B-I-E-R. That's not a word that we use very much. I had to look it up. That is a stand on which a coffin or a corpse is placed. So Jesus walks up, he puts his hand on the beer, and then the procession stops. And uh, he speaks to this dead body. And incredibly, the dead body, well, the alive body now, responded to him. And this this young man sat up in his, his coffin or whatever he was in. And, and the crowd, un, obviously, the, the text says that they were they were seized with fear. Uh, and they concluded that there was a great prophet among them. This miracle is pretty straightforward, but when you think about, I mean, imagine a funeral that you've been to, or maybe you, you're, well, yeah, one that you've been to or experienced. You know, the people at that funeral maybe have had a couple hours, a couple days to let the death sink in. They've, they're trying to come to terms with the fact that this person is gone, and they're carrying the body out to actually bury it. And some stranger comes by, touches the coffin, and your loved one gets up and walks out. I mean, it would be, you'd probably just stand there for a couple seconds, hours, I don't know. Like, what on earth just happened? That's not the way that this thing is supposed to go. Uh, and so they were, they were afraid, I think, probably in both senses. I don't, you know, that fear of respect for somebody great, of awe of somebody, but also just fear because you don't see dead people get up and walk away, ever. This miracle makes me wonder, you know, how could, how could there still be people who didn't believe? I mean, if you saw this firsthand or you heard credible evidence of or eyewitness testimony of a man healing a dead person in a, in a funeral, wouldn't you at least give the guy a shot to prove that he was who he said he was? And I began thinking about that, and I was like, oh, you know, would I, if somebody came up to me and told me that somebody had raised the dead? <laughs> or would I dismiss it like, ah, no, you know, must not have been dead. So somehow it slipped through the cracks or, or, you know, you know, maybe this person's lying to me or uh, maybe the medical, the mortician, you know, didn't do his job, <laughs> didn't do his job right. Or we're pretty good at, at explaining things a way that we maybe don't want to take seriously that might change our lives if we did take them seriously. So I, I kind of wonder, would I have believed? Would I have, a, would I have, you know, given Jesus a fair shake at being the Messiah and proving his claims, or would I have been like a lot of the Jews that just dismissed this and probably said that, uh, you know, it was some kind of scientific mistake, or uh, that that all these people had just lied, or that Nain was a backwater town and you know all the cons- you know just a bunch of conspiracy theories down there. I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting to think about, though. I hope I would have been open to it, but we are good at lying to ourselves and dismissing things. So Jesus has just seen this widow, had compassion on her, raised her son from the dead. Observe Jesus' pity and his power. Those two things very rarely are coupled together in one person. There are lowly people who can relate to the um, the struggles and the difficulties of other lowly people like themselves that you know that's not uncommon and there are also powerful people but unfortunately a lot of times those powerful people they don't have any time for the lowly they don't they have the power to do something about the problems of the poor but they don't necessarily use that power for that purpose maybe they use their power to obtain more for themselves to increase their power here though we have Jesus who is both infinitely powerful and sympathetic towards the, you know, the, I mean, this woman's a widow in, in societal terms. I mean, she's pretty low on the totem pole, but not in the eyes of Jesus. And uh, I think, you know, we see Jesus here, and for an application for us, Jesus saw and he cared for people that were sad, and his heart was stirred with human grief. And that's really easy to think about and just kind of dismiss, um, but I don't think that we should. I think we should, we really should try to be like him in this respect, in every respect, of course, but in this respect. You know, personally, I I find myself compassionless sometimes. And I think as I've gotten older and I've realized, learned a little bit more about the world, I'm growing in compassion, but I'm still not necessarily where I want to be. Sometimes I can look at the, the needs or the struggles of other people and I can say, well, you know, that person, here's why I'm not compassionate. 
or uh, maybe I'm just numb to it, or uh, I just don't take any time to think about maybe what that person is going through. And so there's never any compassion that's stirred up in my heart. Well, here, you know, Jesus is walking, tons of people following him. He's this important guy, and he sees this widow in this funeral procession, and he has time to stop and to care for this woman. We ought to be that way as well. That our heart is stirred by the grief of other people. We don't want to have a compassionless heart. That's not a trait that uh, Jesus would cherish. So this miracle then was spread all throughout the region, and Jesus' fame no doubt grew even more from, from this time on. So those are the only verses I want to cover today. We are going to take off, I think, uh, Wednesdays, Thursday, Friday for the holidays. I know there's going to be a lot of people that are traveling and I'm not going to be traveling, but wouldn't mind a little bit of a break. I'm tossing around the idea of doing a Bible reading plan on this channel to read through the Bible in a year. Uh, I don't know if anybody would be interested in that. I'm not sure what the copyright rules are around that. If that is something that you'd be interested in, let me know down in the description. I know some people like just the accountability of having other people to follow and to read with. So, And frankly, I mean, I couldn't tell you last time I've I've actually never done a Bible reading plan, and uh, I, I've, I think I've read the whole Bible, but I've never done it like in a year in kind of a structured thing, so that would kind of be interesting, and we could definitely incorporate a little bit of Old Testament into this channel, because we've been doing mostly New Testament for quite a while now, so toss an idea around, I may not do it, or I may do it, I may not, we'll see, but anyway. Hope everyone's enjoying their holidays. Hope you didn't eat as much as I ate yesterday and that you're still, you know, reasonably on your diet (laughs) or at least eating healthy. So, all right. uh, I will talk to everybody, Lord willing, tomorrow.